Thank you, yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining to this talk. Um, okay, let's begin our talk regarding um, Django REST framework and how to make it uh, and you go to an, the next level. So first of all, um, who are, are used uh, Django REST framework or no Django REST framework? So great. I don't need to, to make a review. So who am I? I'm Carlos Martinez. I'm from Colombia. I'm backend developer at URIT. Um, you can follow me on uh, Twitter um, or GitHub. And I'll have also, I have uh, on a small blog. Um, in this is Colombia. There's the place that I came from. Um, I'm running the Python Bogota um, group. Um, we have a meetup for about um, 2,500 uh, members right now. Um, I also do photography time to time. I have a daughter, and I do travel photography. Um, so <clears throat> let's begin. We're going to start with a five-minute um, API, and we are going to do something like have users um, create events, have promoters for events and to create tickets. So um, <clears throat> while we are doing this one, we're starting to think about these five topics. How to display different data based on context. For instance, I don't want to, say to get the same fields for an event inside a ticket, for instance. Uh, how to get better performance. How to filter information inside the, the API, um, configure permissions, and how to render results in different formats. Um, let me get out of here, and let's take a look how our first version of the API is going to look like. So um, this is our tickets endpoint. As you can see, I'm sending out a nested object for event and also for user on each ticket that I get. Uh, user has only um, fields, doesn't have any nested object in particular. And um, for promoter, um, for event, sorry, I got the same, but only promoter is the nested object. So um, that's it. That's everything. The API is working. Um, but no. Uh, the problem is here that we have here is if I um, got only 10 items, I guess, I have right now. Yeah, it's not quite much. Uh, it works fine. I get responses in about, um, let's take a look how much time is taking. It's about 100 milliseconds. But let's start to, to create um, a few more tickets. Always happens, this kind of things. Uh, come on. Um, give me one second, please. Maybe I'm in the wrong branch. Yep, that was the reason. Okay. Sometimes happens. Okay, right now I'm creating 5,000 um, new tickets for this API, including promoters and users. So um, it is continue going to, to create a few more. Um, what we're going to see in our API is that all this response time is going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger every time. So um, our API is not done. So first of all, um, something that we can um, start to thinking about is when we have nested objects, we can reuse our serializers. So instead of have different serializers for what is a representation of an event be and inside of ticket and create a new serializer class, we can start to, to use uh, something called dynamic serializers. So we can reuse our logic in a one ser in one serializer and use it for different purposes and different sections of the API. 
So this is um, a dynamic serializer class that you can uh, use. Um, it's, a, it's based on model serializer uh, from Django REST framework. But uh, the difference is that it has um, a different attribute to get fields. And that's what does really the trick. Then you will can uh, create, for instance, in this case, an, an event serializer with a space uh, to get the representation that you expect to get for this particular nested object. So um, you can define um, static methods to get those fields in um, this, this particular serializer. So if everything works fine, it continues creating more things. Um, let me continue there. Maybe I just create too much. Um, so that's, that's the main thing that you can do with dynamic serializer. So you can, for instance, cr create a static method to get uh, location fields, but you can get only another one method to return uh, ID and name, for instance, if you needed to. So that's the way you can create those particular methods. Um, that way you can save time, reuse logic um, within the serializer that you already create, and there's no code duplication. Um, so what about getting better performance? As you can imagine, you, we started pretty good, we started pretty fast, there's no issues, but the things started to get worse and worse when we get more users involved in our, in our application. So um, let's see if that already finishes. Come on, well, I'm going to stop this. Um, and let's take a look to uh, how it's, it, is, it is working now. Um, I'm in, in the right one branch, so let me switch back to the worst um, scenario right now. Um, previously, I just read about um, 15,000 elements. Um, it's trying to, to render that information. And you can see here the, how, the, how Django is making too many queries to the API, to the, sorry, to the database to get all the information that I am asking in this particular endpoint. So until uh, Django doesn't get all that information, it's not going to respond. Um, so that's the reason um, we should start to, to use uh, prefetch. Um, and prefetch, what really does, um, it, it will create for us a different query to a database to try to get all data that we need to make a representation um, for our serializer really easy and in just one query if that's that, the case. For instance, um, let's take a look to what happens when you create the when you get ticket objects dot all it just only is going to create a select with all the fields from uh, the table that you need but when you add select related what it's going to do is going to get all the fields uh, related to that model in particular that you have relation in in that model in particular so here is the same uh, query but it now gets not only the information about ticket, but also the information about user. So it's not going to go again to the database and make 100,000 uh, of, uh, of queries, but instead it's going to be just one. So that small change is going to uh, save you a lot of time. It's going to um, save you a lot of head edges. Uh, so that's the important thing that, uh, that you need to take a look, how to get everything in, in just one query. Um, Prefetch related is going to be the only one that, which is useful, but um, keep in mind that it's uh, great for uh, many to many relationships. And the previous one, as you, we can see, um, we get where user ID equals to users that ID. So that way uh, is making the relationship between them. 
um, on Prefetch related is going to be a little bit different. But is, even though it's going to be better than not making any Prefetch related. So uh, in this case in particular, it's going to do two queries. The first one to get the information about a ticket, and the second one is going to get the information about the events. But it's going to select only the IDs that they need to get that to get the information that they expect. So for instance, if you make a filter for tickets and you are getting just a set of tickets that is, go is going to create a different set of, of IDs that is going to query for the table event. So it's going to be way smaller. Also, something that you can do and you can improve is to use the prefetch object. What uh, really help you out is to get the information that you really need for that particular representation on the API. So if you get, uh, if you see here um, inside the prefetch related, instead of having the string of the related field, I'm getting a prefetch object inside a set the string of the um, attribute or the external or, or the foreign key. And I can create a new query set and select the things that I really need. So uh, with that dot only, I am only asking for, in this case, ID and name. So the query is going to be a little bit more smaller. And when you have a lot of data to, to get in, it's going to, to make the change. So let's take a look if that already finishes. Yep, it takes two minutes and five seconds uh, to complete it. So our user is gone from the application. It's not going to uh, continue with us. Um, so prefetch and related and select related is a must to our, our, when our applications are growing. Um, next that we can do is to um, start to make a filter. How to get um, our, our information in a better way. Um, one package that is really useful to get this is to use Django URL filter. Um, you can set up um, two ways. The easy way is this one. You only add Django filter backend for um, URL filter integrations, DRF, and you can select the filters that you expect to get filters on. Um, and with this in, in particular, you will be able to get to do something like this. So you can go for uh, the endpoint events and you can filter uh, to get a set of IDs if you need to, or you can get um, the name and make sure it contains any particular string that you expect to get, or if a related object uh, has uh, some particular name in this case, and, and you can start to filter even more complicated things. So it's going to help you out to, to, to get complex queries inside the, the URL. But you can also make it with a class and use a model filter set that you can reuse on different endpoints. It's the same thing, the same logic. Uh, it's pretty similar to, to make a serializer, a model serializer. All right. So, um, but we already make prefetch. We already make a few things regarding filtering. What about cache? Uh, we can start to use uh, the Django powerful cache that we um, have out of the box. So to do it, uh, you need to activate those uh, middleware uh, with a red arrow, arrow and make sure that the common, field, common middleware is in the middle, somewhere in the middle. Um, and to make it work uh, using Django REST framework, you need to call these two decorators. Um, Varian cookie um, with the method decorator Varian cookie and the um, decorator to get a catch a page and you can set up the time if, uh, that you want. And if you need to, uh, and I recommend it to, to make it, uh, select and create a K prefix. So that way you, in, you won't forget how to uh, invalidate your cache, your, your cache at this point. 
So um, if you set up this um, in is working, it's going to give you a better performance. Please do not forget to invalidate cache in some way. So drop this line of code somewhere in your code to make sure that when something change, the cache is invalidated uh, at the right time and not after the time expire. Um, <clears throat> but there's something else that we can do to improve our performance using cache. One is a really good package called Django Cache Ops. And what is going to help you out is to cache all ORM transactions that you are doing, and you can um, cache multiple query sets. So um, to use Cache Ops, you need, you need to, to start to work in using Redis. So to, to use it, you add to install apps, as many packages already. Set up your Redis cache, and you can use these configurations to set up a few things regarding what you expect to cache ops to uh, start to to make cache for you. Um, and you can set up your own models and your applications to be cache. So you can define what operation is going to be cache by default. Um, what is going to be the timeout by, by default on, on different applications and different models if you need to. And um, you can define to, um, to create uh, a cache for everything, but it's not quite recommended because you may end up having cache on different things that you really don't want to. Um, so if you need to, you can also make cache um, you, may, you can use cache ops to, to make it by yourself. So um, as you can see, we have um, this get query set from a mold view set, and you can define the, your query as, as expected, but at the end you append a dot cache and open a close in parentheses. And with that, it's going to be cache in, in Redis, and you will get the results, not for from your database, but instead from Redis. So it's going to help you out with performance. Um, but what about permissions? What we can do to improve our, our permissions? Um, actually, Django already has a very great um, permission system, but it, we can try to use something called dry permissions, and it's going to uh, improve our experience. So. <clears throat> um, as any other package, we install with pip dry rest, um, dry rest permissions uh, added to our installed apps. And what, I'm, what we are going to do is to, in, in our view sets, we're going to add permission classes, this, this line over here, and you can define if that's a public endpoint or a pre, um, is required authentication but also add dry permissions. And now you can start to doing something like this. So in your models, you can define um, a set of global permissions. In these cases, is, these examples are, is has permission to read, has permission to write, or has permission to uh, create. So you get access to their request. Uh, at this point, you can say, you can get the user um, and you can make some validations. You can get uh, require a permission, require an attribute inside the the, um, the user, or anything from their request. So um, you can define uh, different different sets of rules for each one. And you can also have object uh, permissions. So it's not only uh, global, but also you can have access to the instance itself and make some validations. The first example is going to make like the user is related to that particular object. And also, you can require, as I mentioned before, a require a particular permission already granted for that user that is requesting access. Um, but even though you, we, you can 
add also permission not to only the object, but also to a field or an action. So if you have a field and you want to protect to um, get rights to a particular field, you can set up this method and you can protect this particular change. Um, and if you define in a view set a uh, different action, um, you can use it in, uh, with a name and you can make a restriction over there. And so all the logic regarding permission is going to be only on each model. So it's easier to find where the, the actual logic is, is there. Um, but you can customize a little bit more. Maybe you want to share uh, a set of permissions within uh, different um, models. One way to, to do it is to create a custom permission. So this is um, based on REST framework permission itself. And you can um, use it for different, uh, you, you, can, you only need to implement the, implement the method has permission and has some utilities. For instance, safe methods are going to be um, get, meta, and options. So if you are given, in this case, access to make, where, uh, make requests to that methods, but is not one of these methods is going to require a permission before you can grant it access for patch, boot, post. So um, that, that can help you out to add this permission to a different view sets, and then uh, you can protect in a different way that particular uh, view set that you that you add that permission. Um, but how to use then drive permissions when you are outside of a model view set? Uh, if you create an API view, you're going to see that it will throw you an error because there is not a key request. So uh, important in those cases, you will need to uh, create your serializer uh, with context. It's going to require to provide a request Otherwise, it's going to throw you an error because uh, the model has not a uh, way to, to get the, the request and make um, and run all your logic that you are defining there. And um, last one um, that I want to bring to you guys to, to take your, your API to another level is to uh, use some renders. So, um, Yesterday, uh, we saw uh, this package working when uh, using Automagic. So um, this is going to be another example. It's very, very useful to, and very easy to implement. So on your um, model view set, you only need to add this particular class, uh, XLS file mixing, and inside renderer classes, um, you need to add Excel renderer. So with that in, with that in mind, you can will you can create Excel files just calling the um, um, the the API by creating by adding a, a new header or making explicitly on the URL. Um, don't forget uh, if you need to if you want to to get uh, to continue having the um, API. HTML view from your from Django REST framework. Don't forget to add browsable API renderer. Otherwise, it's going to be just JSON or or Excel. Um, uh, all this code is going to be available on this repo. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds. You can take a, a picture, and let's take a look to how it works after we do all that things to to this API. Um, so let's take a look. So I'm going to change the branch uh, to master right now. And um, our previous response took two minutes and a little more. And now is only 124 milliseconds. Of course, it's paginated, but that's the idea to get quick responses. Um, and uh, we are getting uh, the event and the user here, 
and uh, you can see here, remember last time we try, I tried to, to do this. These are the logs to all the queries that the Django was doing to get that, inform that representation. And now, uh, this is it. This is what it's really doing right now to get all that information. So it's a really small query. Um, our DevOps team is going to uh, love us to do the kind of thing, that, that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> of course, you can get even a, a little bit more. It's going to take um, extra time to, to render. Um, it depends on how many data you want to, to get. Um, in this case, um, I'm getting all, almost all that that's it, no, uh, 10,000 items, uh, but it's getting seven megabytes of data at this point, and, and it took about uh, three minutes. So maybe that's not what you're expecting to, to, to get, that's not exactly maybe what you need, uh, but you can define the limits um, using the Django REST framework pagination. So, um, well, that's, that's it for now. Um, I, I want to uh, thank you to my team at URIT and also for the client that I work with, uh, Building Engines. Um, that's, that's where all the magic happens and I learned that all these things. Um, so, thank you.